But daily, you have to prime yourself. You have to do something for 10 minutes minimum. If you don't have 10 minutes, you don't have a life. And Ooh, that's so good. I mean, I just like, you got to do it, right? That's good. If you don't have 10 minutes. You don't have a life. To give to priming yourself. That's right. You, don't have you a life want a that... prime life. You want a beautiful life. Yeah. You want a beautiful family. Oh, I'm so, I'm so, I, I, I love that you but say that. But I do. That. It's the first time I wake up in the morning. Yeah. This, people always ask me, how are you so up all the time? But you know, part of it is I attend all these seminars. You know, yes. I teach all this. But the real reason is. You prime I, yourself. I prime myself. That's what I've done for years. It's like I change my body with this radical breathing pattern or movement. There's yeah. many ways to do it. But then I do it through 10 minutes and I do it. It usually goes more because I'm enjoying it. Yeah. But 10 minutes is how I get myself to do it. Three and a half minutes of pure gratitude about three things. And I pick one of those three to be simple because I don't want to be the astronaut that, you know, he went to the moon, that was his idea of adventure, and then they all come back and were depressed because what do I do for the rest of my life? You yes. Know? So the wind in my face, you know, my children's faces, um, anything. And the reason for gratitude is the two emotions that mess us up the most are fear and anger. Yeah. And you can't be grateful and fearful simultaneously. They don't go together. And you can't be angry and grateful simultaneously. So if you literally start your day cultivating that, this part is talking about creating a highway to happiness. Yeah. And then I do three minutes of my three to thrive. What are three outcomes or results I'm really committed to and I see them as done and fulfilled. And in um, 10 for minutes, that day? I, I usually look at something at six months to 12 months out. Wow. Something that's a little bigger. And then but I feel it's fulfilled and done, and I get thanks for it. And you're at the end of those 10 minutes, and usually it's 15 or 18 for me, I am so wired. Now, I've done that for years. It's been the base of me. What's different with suffering is measuring it moment to moment over. And then the third one for me is, okay, how do I love more? Because love to me is an action. It's not a word, it's not an emotion. It's like, if you love, you act accordingly. So love, and what can I do in a loving way? And that, what can I be grateful for? And that little three-step process ends the suffering. 70% of the time, people live in stress. And living in stress is living in survival. Now, all organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress. You know, a deer gets chased uh, uh, by a pack of coyotes. When it outruns the coyotes, it goes back to grazing and the event is over. And the definition of stress is when your brain and body are knocked out of balance, out of homeostasis. The stress response is what the body innately does to return itself back to order. So you're driving down the road, someone cuts you off, you jam on the brakes, you may you give them the finger, and then you settle back down and the event is over and boom, now everything's back, back to normal. But what if it's not a predator that's waiting for you uh, outside the cave, but what if it's your coworker? sitting right next to you and all day long you're turning on those chemicals because they're pushing all your emotional buttons. When you turn on the stress response and you can't turn it off, now you're headed for disease because no organism in nature can live in emergency mode for that extended period of time. It's a scientific fact that the hormones of stress downregulate genes and create disease, long-term effects. Human beings, because of the size of the neocortex, we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. We can think about our problems and turn on those chemicals. That means then our thoughts could make us sick. So if it's possible that our thoughts could make us sick, is it possible then our thoughts could make us well? And the answer is absolutely yes. All of you have targets, things that you're after. If you're gonna get a new result, if you're gonna grow your business, if you're gonna be able to support your mom, if you're gonna get rid of the anxiety, if you're gonna be able to overachieve and not have all that fear inside of you, you obviously need to get a new result. You're gonna to have to get new action. We all know that. You don't get new results with old action. What human beings can do is amazing. What they will do is usually disappointing. It's not because we're not capable of it. It's because we don't have new actions because we get in certain emotional states that dominate us, like anxiety, like fear of failure. So if you're in a state of fear, you're gonna behave very differently and get very different results than if you were in a place of being courageous or bold or warm or connected or playful, any of those. So the most important key to changing your life in any situation is to change results, you gotta change behavior, but to change behavior, you gotta change the emotional state you're in. The fact is this, you are playing the program 95% of the day, meaning your life is a printout of your program. Anything you're struggling to try to accomplish, whether it's health or love, uh, relationships, whatever it is, 
If you're struggling, it represents a simple fact. Your subconscious programming doesn't support that conclusion. So the fact is, what are my programs? Look at your struggle. And wherever you're struggling, the struggle is not because the universe won't provide for you. The struggle is an internal job. The struggle is you're trying to overcome previous programming that prevents you to go to that destination. So the wonderful part about this understanding is you don't have to, to review your life. You can look right now at this one moment, just look in your head and say, what are the things that I keep trying to get? And they, they seem to be elusive. I can't get them. They're always out of reach. I say, the universe is not holding back. It's your own invisible subconscious behavior. And once you understand where the issues are, and you start to really focus on the point that it's not the universe that's providing the trouble, it's myself. You have the first inclination, the first idea, the first understanding of how to change your life because now you know exactly what issue is confronting you. You can change the programming. You can rewrite your subconscious programs. If you took the wishes and desires of the conscious mind and used that as a program to put the beliefs into the subconscious mind, it's the most exciting and liberating thing you can ever do in your life. You know why? Because once it's in the subconscious program, 95% of the day without you even thinking about it, your mind will take you to that direction. And that is your freedom. I define concentration as the ability to keep that awareness on one thing for a prolonged period of time. So if I can keep my awareness on Eric and not drift away and think about the wedding or drift away and think about the vacation or what I'm going to do later, then I'm concentrating on Eric. Every time it drifts away, I bring it back. And the more I practice this, the more I practice concentration. So concentration is the ability to keep your awareness on one thing for a prolonged period of time. And that's a very simple definition of concentration. How do you get better at concentration? You practice this. You practice this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's the only way to get good at it. And what's the best way to practice it? The best way to practice it is to integrate it into everything that you do in your life not to meditate 10 minutes in the morning. It doesn't work. You really need to look at your life the same way a sprinter in the Olympics looks at his life. You've all heard of Usain Bolt, the man that won the gold medal twice, two Olympics in a row, broke the world record. I don't know anything about him, to be honest. But if I was looked at him, I would assume he goes to the gym, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you look at him, he's pretty ripped. He obviously sprints, he practices running, probably does a lot of long distance, he probably does a lot of stretching as well, I'm sure he gets massages. He looks like he eats the right kind of food, drinks the right amount of water, takes vitamins. His whole day is so disciplined, for what? To prepare him for 9.57 seconds, I think that's what the world record is, right? 400 meters, 9.5 or 9.57 seconds. His whole day is preparing him for that short time, not the other way around. A lot of people say, you know what, I need to be more concentrated. So you know what, I'm going to meditate in the morning, I'll sit down for two minutes. Okay, now I'm Zen master. <laughs> and the remaining 23 hours and 58 minutes, they just go about being ordinary and crazy. How does that work? How would you change? It's not balanced at all. So if for 23 hours and 58 minutes you were not being concentrated, you allowed your awareness to jump from one thing in your mind to another thing, to another thing, to another thing, to another thing, in an uncontrolled way, what would you be good at? The best way to do it is pick a few opportunities in your everyday life. For example, we all speak with people. When I speak with somebody, I give them my undivided attention. I keep my awareness on them. And the conversation is really brief, why? Because we're concentrated, we're not being distracted. A 10 minute conversation normally just takes three minutes because you're just so focused. And out of con a, a prolonged concentration comes the wonderful power of observation. 
you just become more observant. And when you become more observant, you see solutions quicker and you solve things quicker. And it's a wonderful, powerful feeling when somebody is concentrated on you and not being distracted. The only way to break a habit, you guys, is not to deal with the triggers. You're never gonna get rid of the stress in your life, but you can 100% change your pattern of avoiding work. It's this fear of discomfort. People have this extreme feeling in their mind uh, when it comes to their associations with exercise. That's one of my first feeling that I could hit the ball from any part of the court and feel like I could do it with closed eyes and make it and know exactly where it's going. It made an impression on me and since then for the past 33 years I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself if today were the last day of my life would I want to do what I am about to do today. If you try and change yourself according to thinking that oh I'm going to a different country or you know I need to please or I need to um, not be alien enough or you're overthinking it. So that's that one voice. This other voice that we walk very far away from is a voice saying hey man you ain't doing shit. So what you have to do first is turn up this voice over here. The voice saying things to you that aren't nice. Your body is like a race car that you can juice up yourself. Like you can add the fat tires, you can add the improved suspension, you can beef up the horsepower in the engine, you can do all that yourself. You have to be open to understand and accept the fact that you won't know everything. Right. And people won't know everything about you. So it's an education. I'm enjoying so much. You have to accept your uniqueness. Yeah, I want to do things that people are like, oh, she's doing that now. I look for things like that, whether it's acting, producing, I don't know what it'll be, I, I don't know. If you want to be an anomaly, you have to act like one. Like people want all these special things to happen, but then they're acting like everybody else. Victory, I wanted to win. Not like beat somebody else. It wasn't about that. I, I, I just wanted to go the distance. Everything in my life, when something got hard, I quit. It's this whole new perspective on it. And I think nature, I think, the ease of suffering is always in presentness. You know, when you're in presentness, truly locked in, in presentness, there is no suffering. There can be pain, but no suffering. Suffering is, an, is something created by our own minds. Think, we all think our stuff is the best, and like, I get that. But yeah, that would be my advice, only because that also is liberating. To me, everything's about breathing, right? Like, to me, everything is about, like, take full ownership for everything, and then everything gets easy, because then you're in control. The more I did this, the more I gained confidence. And then the more I gained confidence, the more I realized I was just sacrificing. And then through that, all these different tools started coming up. But I would have never found these tools if I didn't put myself in a very uncomfortable place.